432 Park Avenue, a super tall building with apartments that sell for tens of millions of dollars. It's located on Billionaire's Row, of course, an area that's become known as the personal piggy bank of the ultra rich. Here, the super talls and super wealthy collide. However, what happens when developers allegedly put height before a building's integrity? Today, that's what we're going to find out. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about a very specific building in New York City, 432 Park Avenue. Now, this building has become so controversial in recent years that even TikTokers like Louisa Talks Buildings have spoken out about the design, development, and litigation surrounding the building. I wanted to take a look at the debate around 432 Park today and why it may only be a sign of more controversial super talls to come. So let's dive into it. In 2006, New York developer Harry Macklow bought the Drake Hotel for $418 million. The Drake stood for just over 80 years before. In 2007, he tore it down with plans to turn it into an L-shaped building with luxury condominiums. He also wanted to include Manhattan's first Nordstrom store and a hotel even more elegant than the Drake had ever been. Not only was this building meant to be the epitome of luxury, but it's also located on what's called Billionaire's Row, the name given to a stretch of skyscrapers near Central Park. Billionaire's Row has refined the city skyline and is as shady as it is expensive, with buyer's identities being concealed by shell companies more often than not, but more on that later. Anyway, Macklow invested over 150 million personally in the project because the bank, Deutsche Bank, promised to refinance his loans once they matured in late 2007. That never came to be because of obviously the economic crisis and shortly after they lost a massive portion of their real estate empire. According to the New York Times, they had to give up seven Midtown office buildings and sold their prized General Motors building on Fifth Avenue on 59th Street. Inside sources claim that he'd acquired the seven buildings less than a year earlier for $7 billion. So needless to say that the real estate credit crisis hit him extra hard. Now, Macklow became a symbol of the last commercial sales boom and the Wall Street Journal said that his loss certainly earned him a page in the history of great real estate debacles. Even so, Macklow had been known for his stubbornness in hard times, given that he lost major properties during the real estate collapse of the 90s. Plus, as a fun aside, you might actually know him for having a bitter border war with, of all people, Martha Stewart, his neighbor in the Hamptons. He claimed she tore out 14 trees and bushes on his property to get a better view of Georgica Pond, but ultimately lost the dispute. Anyway, things seemed to look difficult at this moment, but Macklow clung to the Drake project, determined to see it through to completion. In 2008, he bought unused development rights or air rights at a record $520 per square foot to allow for his building to be even taller. Deutsche Bank and he battled as they sold roughly 547 of his $559 million loan to various investment groups, all while the Maclows sounded like a jilted lover in court documents, stating how the bank lied to them and betrayed their trust. And I know I'm mentioning Deutsche Bank, and I know for those of you that are listening on YouTube are gonna be quick and swift to get to the comment section and be like, hey, you need to do an episode on Deutsche Bank. I assure you, there is research in progress. Deutsche Bank is on the menu. But anyway, once this project was finally off the ground, literally and figuratively speaking, Macklow had high ambitions for the brand new 432 Park Avenue. Perhaps it was just to spite the bank. Maybe it was to prove that he could still be successful after losing much of his empire. Or perhaps it was to leave something behind. Either way, he seemed determined to make 432 memorable. And by memorable, I mean extremely fucking tall. The tallest residential building in the Western Hemisphere once it was completed. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. There'll never be another job like this one. It's going to live on for a very long time after I'm gone, he said in 2013 in the New York Times. He was developing the building with CIM Group and went so far as to call it the true distillation of everything I've learned. Rafael Vignoli, the architect, had nothing but praise for Macklow, calling him a picaresque character and a very special guy who is completely honest about his passions. So together, they were sure to build an incredible residential skyscraper that wowed everyone, right? Well, they wouldn't be on today's episode if that were the case. But to give you a hint of what's to come, they based the original design of the building on a trash can. Macklow said this Josef Hoffman wastebasket from 1905 has a rhythm, a pattern, and a push-pull between negative and positive. 
He argued that their building was more attractive than other super talls going up across New York City, and that architecture critics and the public alike had a lot of good things to say about 432 Park Avenue. On the other hand, I've found numerous articles calling it the ugliest luxury condo building, or as the New York Times puts it, the tallest, if not the fairest. Mecklow himself said it was like the Mona Lisa, except instead of it looking at you, you're looking at the building wherever you are. You can't escape it. And I just, I, I need to take a moment here, right? Just, just, just a personal moment, because it was very hard for me when I first learned of what this building was to understand how such a fucking ugly thing could be allowed. Newark had such a pretty skyline and then this thing goes up and it sticks out like a sore fucking thumb. It's this ugly rectangle with a bunch of holes that are now windows and I just don't get it. So it was like this moment where I was like, oh my God, this literally like ugly fucking thing that looks like it was bore out with giant termites now houses billionaires and tons of rich people's money in shitty condos. I was like, you damn right. I sense something's crappy about this building and there is. Now, of course, whether or not you considered this so-called Mona Lisa building a positive or negative for the New York City skyline when the skyscraper was completed in 2015, what did matter is that the building wasn't architecturally sound. The same year the building went up, some argued it was already showing cracks. Real estate author Michael Gross wrote a blog post that said two connected sources confirmed that the architectural concrete that covers the poured concrete tower has already developed cracks and that the scaffolding on the building was there because a top masonry restoration company, Nicholson Galloway, was hired to coat the structure in silane to seal the fissures. He added that Lendlease 432's builder was also responsible for the building 157, the site of an infamous crane incident back in 2012. To summarize what happened here, during Hurricane Sandy, a crane at 157 West 57th Street snapped. This wasn't during the full brunt of the storm, but actually hours beforehand. No one knew how secure the crane was. Mayor Bloomberg stated as much at the time. So several buildings nearby were forced to evacuate as it dangled high above Central Park. Investigations and experts later revealed that the worker who secured the crane prevented it from weather veining freely, rotating at the winds, causing the accident. But hey, a few superficial cracks doesn't mean anything, right? Surely if this was Macklow's legacy piece as he claimed it would be, it would be a well thought out project and carefully crafted and safe, right? Wrong. In February, 2021, the New York Times released a bombshell article detailing the lives of those living at 432 Park Avenue and what this trash can lookalike building was like on the inside. As it turned out, a trash can was actually quite an appropriate comparison. One couple that were retired oil and gas business owners that purchased one on the high floors, a 3,500 square foot apartment for $17 million. Sorry for that hesitation. I just realized how much fucking money that was for how little space. That's, mm -mm, no, I'm having a hard time with that. They said, I was convinced it would be the best building in New York. They're still building it as God's gift to the world. And it's not, Serena said. She also claimed that she's aware that the plight of billionaires won't garner much sympathy, but she's still speaking out on principle. On day one, when Serena was ready to move into what she naturally expected to be a completed apartment, her unit and the building itself were still under construction. She was led up to her apartment in a freight elevator with a hard hat operator surrounded by steel plates and plywood. A couple of years after she started moving in, the building flooded twice in the same month. On November 22nd, 2018, a blown flange used to connect piping led to a flood on the 60th floor. Four days later, water entered elevator shafts on the 74th floor because of a waterline failure. Two of the four residential elevators were removed from service for weeks, according to the New York Times report. And the water that leaked into her apartment caused about half a million dollars worth of damages. An anonymous buyer said the floods were catastrophic from the 83rd to 86th floors, leading them to back out of a deal for $46.25 million for an apartment, which holy hell, that is so much money. Residents also complained of creaking and loud noises within the apartments from the building swaying in the wind and said the trash chute sounded like a bomb in a 2019 owner's meeting. Despite the complaints, 432 Park Avenue only grew more expensive for the residents. Rather than pay $1,200 per year in fees for the building's private restaurant, owners were expected to pay $15,000. 
and the restaurant opened less frequently once 2020 rolled around too due to the pandemic. All in all, annual common charges jumped about 40% in 2019. This hike in prices may have been because of the building itself thanks to the flooding and had a 300% insurance increase. Needless to say, residents were frustrated and grumpy about the building most of the time. Everyone hates each other here, Selena told the New York Times speaking at the tension at 432 Park. She and her husband were not worried about the resale value, but the increase in common charges as they intended on actually living there. Since Selena outright refused to cover them, she now faces $82,000 in late fees and interest, at least at the time of the article's publication in February, 2021. Eventually, all of this culminated into a lawsuit pitting residents and developers against one another very publicly. The $125 million lawsuit filed in September, 2021, detailed how there were far more than just a few leaks at 432 Park Avenue, but over 1,500 construction and design defects to common elements of the building alone. Now, I can't confirm this because I am not a lawyer and because this is only about the common areas it has no regard to the individual apartment buildings. In my opinion, this might mean that people like Selena who had their apartment flooded could bring a suit against the developers later. Even if the insurance fixed the apartment itself or covered any belongings that were damaged or lost due to the flooding, there does seem to be a possibility of individuals suing here and settling with the developers later on. After all, I suppose $125 million is nothing, I guess, when you consider how expensive it would be to live there and what apartments themselves cost. I'm trying really hard not to be too sympathetic here, to be honest, but like, I mean, like it's someone who's still losing money, so I feel bad. And then I hear how much money it is, then I don't feel so bad. Anyway, I'm curious to see if this will be the first in multiple suits or not. But again, I've got no way to know for sure if this is the route the residents are considering. Now, within this specific lawsuit itself, the board of managers at 432 Park stated that the building was marketed as world-class, premium, and one of the finest condominiums in the city. Owners paid tens of millions of dollars for these units, but the building is, quote, plagued by breakdowns and failures that have endangered and inconvenienced residents, guests, and workers, and repeatedly been subject of highly critical accounts of the press and social media. The elevators repeatedly shut down, have trapped residents and unit owners, family members inside, waiting for hours for rescue, while residents have no elevators left to use. And before you say take the stairs, remember that some of these people are old as heck. They most certainly are geriatric and elderly retirees and they probably cannot climb 80 floors up or down to or from their apartment. Plus, who would want to climb 80 floors anyway? If I want to punish myself like that, I will go back onto the Stairmaster. I was gonna say the treadmill, but no, that's a different torture. The Stairmaster. I hate those things at the gym. So I wouldn't do this willingly. I go and use the Stairmaster when I want to hurt myself and hate my life that day, like extra hard. So... If you're living there and just trying to get home and find out you essentially have to take a Stairmaster hell of a walk to get to your apartment, I'd be a little pissed to say the least. Anyway, 56th and Park New York Holdings LLC is called sponsor within the lawsuit. And at one point when they're named, it's during a particularly disturbing incident. So here's what that suit alleges. On a recent occasion, due to the failure of the sponsor to among other things, create, maintain, and provide proper as-built drawings and its failure to properly supervise contractors, a worker attempting another Band-Aid fix to the water infiltration issues drilled through concrete into the building's electrical wiring, causing an explosion, damaging the building's electrical supply and cutting the feed to one of the building's chillers, supplying air conditioning to many of the building's residents. The damage required immediate emergency repairs, including a shutdown of the building's electrical supply and cost in excess of $1.5 million. Not only did the sponsor allegedly refuse to accept responsibility and address the damage, but they left it for the board to handle. Plaintiffs claim that the sponsor was too busy dickering with its contractors and insurance carriers over who had financial responsibility, rather than taking into account the resident's safety and well-being. The lawsuit also alleges that this was actually the second arc flash explosion to occur within the past three years, though not much detail is given over the first instance. The sponsor withheld engineering reports, prompting residential owners to commission and pay for them themselves, hence how 1,500 defects were revealed to them. Allegedly, only nine of the 1,500 defects have actually been repaired. The persistent plumbing, even on high floors, were due to poor plumbing installation. The noise and vibration issues have been so bad that some unit owners have been forced to temporarily move out, and in one case, it was for over 19 months. And there are visible cracks above doorways. Even the building's energy efficiency rating is a D, the lowest possible score for buildings that admit the requisite data. Essentially, if you can imagine any issue with an apartment building, aside from it literally keeling over, 432 probably has it. Now, Raphael, on the other hand, has referred to these as just a couple of mistakes. 
sure. As an aside, what I find interesting is that even though this litigation was in the works, popular video tours were still released of the building. One of the most watched from a YouTuber, Ryan Serhant, was released in July, 2021, a few months after the New York Times bombshell article, but a few months before the lawsuit. In it, he states that 432 Park is an eighth wonder of the world. It's designed to perfection and the views are unlike anything he's ever seen in a home in New York City before. He also makes an important note saying that because the weight of the building is held at its core, you have an apartment layout and hallways unencumbered by structural columns. Another popular video tour was released by Eric Conover after the suit was filed in November, 2021. As per the title of his video, a penthouse at 432 Park sold for $135 million at the time, more money than the lawsuit was even seeking. He claims that the tea room has 1000 year old cedar in it from Yakushima, where it's now illegal to harvest cedar. Therefore, this feature is extremely rare and no doubt contributes to the $135 million price tag. Even the blinds are a kind of rare cedar with motorized customized controls. And I'm sorry, but just to insert my opinion here, what in the rich people shit is this? Like I just, I clearly uh, do not have a sophisticated enough palette to understand how that's truly a flex. If I went over to a friend's house and they go, oh Blair, you should take a look at this cedar wood in my house. It's a thousand years old and it's now illegal to harvest this type of cedar. I'd be like, I mean, okay, did you find it at Goodwill or something? <laughs> and then, no, I paid millions of dollars for it. Like, I just, I'm clearly not the demographic here, right? Like that's obviously the case. I don't understand this. Like I can understand like having a smart house and technology and maybe even like a, like, um, what are those like fancy bug cars? Um, someone's gonna get mad at me for saying that stuff. I don't remember what it's called. A pa Pagani, I think. They look like they have bug eyes, like just their little antenna side mirrors. Car people are gonna hate me for saying that. I apologize in advance. I clearly don't know cars either. <laughs> the point is, I am clearly not the demographic to understand this type of price tag. It just is wild to me that someone would and has done this. Now, when we look at like these YouTube videos of these real estate folks or whatever, going to these expensive homes and touring them and showing them to all of us, I don't really expect them to talk about the building's structural integrity. I understand that's probably a good way for Eric and Ryan to drive people away from their videos if they did. However, no matter how pleasing you might find the aesthetics, it's the structural integrity that really does interest me here. In the lawsuit, it stated multiple times how the height of the building wasn't properly accounted for and the elevator shutdowns, noises, creaks, and things of that nature were actually due to the wind and sway of the building. Building. How does this happen in New York City, a city literally known for its skyscrapers? As it actually turns out, there's a reason for it and it's not exciting. There's a massive gaping loophole in the building laws in New York City that allows for super tall buildings to be constructed without really revealing their true height. The New York Times actually explained this in 2019 using none other than 432 Park as an example. See, floors that are reserved for structural and mechanical equipment, no matter how many they are, don't count against a building's maximum size laws. Therefore, developers can literally throw in unused floors just to make their building taller and make those top floors that much more expensive. 432 Park did exactly that. About a quarter of their floors are actually unused and dedicated to structural and mechanical equipment. They reap obvious benefits as condos at the top sell for seven and a half thousand per square foot or $30 million for an apartment. Whereas those halfway down sell for a little over half as much. Some say this is a loophole in the system and one that's clearly being exploited here. Now, before we continue to talk about the why and why does something like this happen, let's take a quick break to thank today's sponsors. If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2022, why overpay for wireless service? Especially when Mint Mobile service starts at just 15 bucks a month. I've been using them for over a year now and they have been one of the most satisfying and easy to work with companies I think I've worked with when it comes to using a cell phone. One of my favorite parts about them is that they sell their service online only. So they pass that savings on to you. But almost more importantly, in my opinion, is that I don't have to go into a store. I don't have to talk to anybody. I don't even have to call anybody. They literally have an app. If you wanna download it onto your phone so you can switch that way, or you can just do it on your computer. You don't have to even talk to anybody. But when you do have to talk to somebody, they're actually very nice. All their plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. So if you wanna get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. There's so many products right now promising a good night's sleep because truly who is sleeping well lately. Well, 
nothing helps more than getting a better mattress. And that's why it's worth getting a Purple mattress. Only Purple mattresses have the Gel Flex Grid, a super stretchy, ultra squishy material that adapts and flexes around pressure points and doesn't retain heat. The Gel Flex Grid supports your back and legs and yet also cushions your shoulders, neck, and hips. I'm actually really impressed by how well it doesn't retain heat. I recently, like most of my life, I've been a cold sleeper, but as of recently, I've been sleeping really, really warm and Purple has been helping keep that a little bit more under control. And not to mention last year, they sent me their purple pillows and Casper stole them. And as you guys know, he's an Arctic dog. So he's obviously always very warm and covered in fur and he loves that thing. So I only assume it's very cooling for him too. And you can try your purple mattress risk-free with free shipping and returns. Financing is also available too. And getting that great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. So get a purple mattress, go to purple.com slash casket and use code casket. For a limited time, you can get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash casket with code casket for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Purple.com slash casket, promo code casket. Terms apply. Macklow himself denies that the many, many mechanical floors in 432 Park Avenue are simply to make the building rise higher and claims that each one has equipment necessary for the building to function. And if that's the case, I've got to wonder why the fuck the building is functioning so poorly, but I digress. Every block of Manhattan is assigned a square maximum footage. So developers, if they buy unused square footage from their neighbors, whose air rights we mentioned, and if they have a lot of mechanical floors, they can create these skinny mega towers with relative ease. There are proposed rules to combat this, such as counting oversized mechanical floors with ceilings of 30 feet high towards a building's maximum size. In addition to limiting mechanical space, there would also be a requirement of at least 75 feet in between them. This, as Mayor de Blasio puts it, will stop luxury developers from gaming the system. On the other hand, engineer Bart Sullivan claims that super tall skyscrapers genuinely need unoccupied floors for elevator motors, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. The proposed rules will only tie the hands of design professionals. At 432 Park Avenue, these unoccupied sections allow wind to flow through and stabilize the building. And without these open air mechanical floors, 432 Park would noticeably sway, only making things worse for the residents. Now, whether or not these rules are a genuine necessity for super talls, the American Institute of Architects New York argues that this particular mechanical floor zoning loophole has been taken advantage of at times. AIA New York supports the limits on mechanical void height, though they don't support another proposed amendment, which would limit ceiling height in residential buildings to 12 feet. That would affect all spaces, not just mechanical voids. AIA argues this would make design more uniform and monotonous, which would disproportionately affect lower income areas where new constructions tend to be concentrated. And as a somewhat obvious disclaimer here, I'm not an architect. I'm sure that's quite shocking. Sorry to disappoint. Now I can't know how necessary mechanical void spaces are. And if every single one in 432 is completely essential or to some extent, if Macklow is stretching the truth when he says as much. Personally, when I hear that literally a quarter of the building, 25% of it is just mechanical space, it feels a bit ridiculous, especially in a city with such a large homeless population, though we'll get to that last bit in just a moment. As for the developers themselves, their response to this controversy was less than favorable to say the least. They claimed that they tried to complete needed repairs, but that the board itself actually blocked their access to the building by repeatedly canceling planned work at the last minute and deactivating the keys of developer representatives. Personally, I don't see what the board could possibly get out of doing this. It doesn't make sense to me that they would prevent repairs. However, as everything is alleged, and of course the case is still unfolding, we don't know which party is telling the truth or if there's a gray area in between. Maybe there were a few times that the board canceled plans, though if developers gave up attempting to fix said issues, that would still be inexcusable. The developers have also said that the building is without a doubt safe and said that many of the board's demands aren't required on the building's design, codes, or any legal documents. They also claim that the suit was merely a publicity campaign, though for those who want to eventually sell their apartment at 432, this hardly seems like good publicity. Sales have massively declined within the super tall, dropping to about four transactions in the past two years, whereas in 2019, it sold 12 units. However, this is also likely due to the pandemic. So it's a bit difficult to know how sure the expose has affected them and the lawsuit has affected them. Since the property values themselves are actually still climbing, it's not as if the apartments are worthless by any means. 
On the other hand, while Park 432 certainly has its issues, the building also has fueled conversation about Billionaire's Row in general and how these apartments aren't really just homes at all, just piggy banks for the super rich. Buyers of these apartments on Billionaire's Row, which typically cost tens of millions of dollars, can obscure their identities through shell companies. These homes, if you can call them that, will often sit empty throughout the year, making these condos and super talls the living epitome of an investment for the super rich and super rich only. Kurt Henkels, the vice chairman of Stribling & Associates, a real estate agency in New York City claims, we've become a global piggy bank. When you're talking about a bank account that big, diversification is a basic rule of economics and investment. It's a wonderful way to justify investing in your toys. The idea of an apartment on Billionaire's Row being just a toy is so far beyond many of our wildest dreams. And as the New York Times argues, real estate isn't even the most lucrative long-term investment either. Though residential property in Manhattan has appreciated 26% over the last five years, the Standard & Poor's 500 stock index is up more than 75% in the same amount of time. Still, it's the returns within New York real estate that have outperformed almost any other asset class, with sellers having an average of 32% profit. Plus, for the super wealthy that travel, they do get something out of it, treating these apartments like hotels when they visit New York City. Now, for those who compare it to art or jewelry, another investment that tends to appreciate and cost an astronomical fucking price, they make the point that you can't steal an apartment. Plus, there's more space on Park Avenue than there are billionaires that want to live in New York. Whereas with fine art, there's a limited number of Picassos and Warhols in the world. Plus, more good news for the billionaires, their owners aren't subject to New York taxes either, even if they own an apartment on Billionaire's Row. Since the towers are practically vacant, the owners aren't city residents. New York State and City have begun another crackdown on this and proposed an annual recurring tax on second homes valued at more than $5 million. As expected, intense lobbying has derailed this and recurring tax has been replaced with a one-time fee instead. According to the New York Times, the tax had finally been gaining traction and would have helped pay for public transit. But the moment the real estate industry was consulted, they hired well-connected lobbyists who wrote pieces that warned the market would collapse under the weight of a recurring surcharge and killed the proposal. One of the bill's sponsors, Assemblywoman Deborah Glick said, I don't think there's a question that real estate has driven politics really forever. So it's not a shock. Assembly Speaker Carl Hastie also claimed that the one-time tax at the time of sale is easier to navigate and will generate roughly the same amount to the city's subway system, around 300 to $400 million. And he claims that aligns with 370 million that the Real Estate Board of New York says the annual tax would have brought in. However, the New York City Comptroller disputes the Real Estate Board numbers, which estimates that an annual tax would have brought in nearly twice as much at a minimum of 650 per year. All in all, the real estate industry's narrative won out. In fact, it's won out so much that not only is Billionaire's Row littered with virtually empty luxury apartments and investment properties, but the city has condo fatigue on the Upper West Side. Residents in the area have contested a 69-story condo where construction has stalled for years from legal challenges, a 52-story condo where a judge unsuccessfully ordered the developer to remove the top 20 floors, and a 20-story building called ERA that they oppose the mass and design of. There's been lawsuits, protests, and neighborhood preservationalist groups insisting that these buildings run cross grain to the fabric of the neighborhood. Still, developers seem to be winning. Despite a Supreme Court judge siding with community organizers in 2020 to remove those top 20 floors, the developers won out on appeal. Olive Freud, founder of the Committee for Environmentally Sound Development, said these decisions have the potential to lead to a ripple effect. If they get away with it, that means they can do anything. The decision could affect an awful lot of housing in New York from here on out, they stated. Even papers across the country, such as the LA Times, have criticized this trend of super tall towers in New York City. Writer Christopher Hawthorne argues in one article that 432 is emblematic of the rising inequality in New York City, even if it's far from the only super tall luxury apartment building around. It looms over Manhattan, he says, follows you from neighborhood to neighborhood, and it's even visible from Brooklyn. Even when 432 Park sells out, it likely won't be half full, but only hold about 100 residents at a time. Billionaire's Row is a block of equity and other luxury condos are starting to look the same. Yet, whether this is worrying because you have to consider how many loopholes will be manipulated or how many ugly buildings will occupy the skyline, the other depressing thought to keep in mind is that New York City has a massive homeless population. 
It doesn't seem right that in a city where one out of every 106 New Yorkers is homeless, roughly 80,000 people, that they're building skyscrapers that will remain virtually empty. The fact that New York City has condo fatigue with such a large homeless population is insanely disheartening. And if I'm being honest, disheartening doesn't even feel like a strong enough word. I think it's insulting. In my opinion, this might be another form of hostile architecture, purposefully building massive skyscrapers to be used as piggy banks for billionaires in a city where almost 1% of the population are in shelters or in the streets. Now, since this isn't guiding or restricting behavior, I know this doesn't fit the dictionary definition of hostile architecture for the record, but perhaps maybe passive aggressive architecture? If, is that a thing? It's messed up at best, that's all I'm saying. Billionaire's Row highlights a lot of issues we've spoken out about today. And while there's always been controversy to these developments, 432 Park has specifically inspired a lot of recent articles that criticize them. Four Facades, for example, points to 432 Park as the reason for their article, What's Wrong with New York's Billionaire's Row? Where they explain how pointless masks and spires on skyscrapers solely exist to make them taller than competitors. Even Macklow himself supposedly said that it's this penis envy, as he calls it, that's fueling newer super tall towers. The article also says that buying air rights are treated as a winner takes all in the game of Monopoly and points to multiple sources calling Billionaire's Row an enclave that's become a symbol of the city's increasingly stupendous riches, with the median sale in the area being about $10 million. 432 Park itself is actually expected to bring in around $3 billion in profit alone. All in all, 432 Park isn't the tallest, the first or last super tall with astronomical prices that are treated as an investment. However, I'd personally argue that the structural issues with the building, the cracks, the floods, and the things of that nature really show how 432 Park is meant to be a piggy bank and not a home. Of course, that's just my opinion, but I'd be curious to hear about yours. Do you think these developments are an issue, a symbol of wealth inequality, or just tall buildings that people are reading way too far into? Let me know. Also, if you want to hear more stories about inequality in architecture, make sure to check out our Hostile Architecture episode. And if you want to hear about other designs that seem doomed to fail, make sure to look at the episode on the Seawall Ferry. Or if you're in the mood to go down something as depressing as the Seawall Ferry route, maybe check out the Hotel Collapse video too. Thank you for making it to another Corporate Casket episode. I hope you learned something new here today. I appreciate you spending some of your time here with me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. I'm going to go to the hospital.